Hi, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Saif Jabari. I'm an associate professor here at uh, NYU Abu Dhabi, associate professor of civil and urban engineering. I am also a co-PI in the Center of Interacting Urban Networks, Cities. Um, we at NYU and Cities are very pleased to be collaborating with Mostar City on this new Cities Lecture Series. Uh, we've shared, we have a shared vision to create more sustainable cities, and our goal is to facilitate meaningful knowledge exchange between academia and industries such as urban planning, urban design, engineering, and architecture. Our focus for this year will be on decarbonizing cities. Uh, we're very excited to be welcoming Chris Wan, uh, the Associate Director of Sustainability and CSR at Muslar City for our inaugural lecture called Walking the Talk, How Does a City Achieve Net Zero? Chris is a seasoned architect who has worked extensively in architecture, sustainability, and design management in the UK, Hong Kong, and the UAE. He has worked at Muslar City for the last 15 years. His current focus is advocating for sustainability, ESG and CSR at Muslar City and beyond. Welcome, Chris. This, by the way, is not part of the lecture. So thank you for coming uh, tonight. I see uh, an amazing turnout, and I hope that's um, because we're all in this room uh, sharing sort of common background, common ideas, with uh, interest to understand how cities can decarbonize. Um, Mazda City, a project in Abu Dhabi, uh, was, was started construction in 2008. Six square kilometers of land, 3.7 million squ uh, square meters of planned development. We probably today covered about 40% of the land area in terms of uh, development. And it is a mixed development, it is an innovation zone, it is a free zone, it has parks, it has communities, it, um, the, the mixed development has residential components and business components and community components. So all these things are aspects of cities. And as important as these things are today, I'm just gonna be concentrating to talk about one particular subject, about how Mazda City is working towards a decarbonization. So straight in, I have some metrics related to Mazda City. These are the actual operational figures from 2022. We're currently compiling our 2023 figures. And you see, uh, across the board, there are certain percentages uh, reduction in energy, water, and waste, and even have on the far right-hand side what we are doing with generators and sidecars. So we're capturing all this data. I think the most important thing here is these are operational data. I come from a world of design, and in design through architecture and engineering, one can make the very best assumptions and design to those assumptions. But when it comes to real life uh, practice and the tenants move in, the building owners move in, many, many different variables come into place. And working with our facility management team, we're always trying to figure out if there are any challenges. And then we do energy audits, water audits to improve these areas. So these are actually um, operational data, then converted into carbon on the bottom line, about the, the tonnage of carbon emissions we are effectively saving. Um, that conversion is done through understanding conversion factors issued by uh, EWEC. But when you look at this, the most interesting thing 
is that there's a very wide range of numbers. You've got 257 tons on the bottom right-hand side and 7,400 tons on the bottom uh, left-hand side. Right? So clearly, energy is having a really big impact on the city. In fact, energy is 10 times the water emissions impact. Now, either someone's doing something, someone is doing something really well in water and we're using so little water or we're doing something very poorly with energy, or it's just coming to a realization, although both energy and water are really, really important and water scarcity is a major issue in this country, when you actually look at the energy profile, and these are numbers from, the, from our ADDC bills, they tell a story that gives us an indicator of how to start addressing decarbonisation. So the concentration is on energy. When you break that down, um, just to get, give you an indication of the scale we're talking about, this uh, saving that we are having, or this uh, carbon reduction we're having, is probably today for us about 1,600 cars off the road. Right? People don't understand tonnage of carbon, but people can understand cars. Uh, in this particular case, this car that we are using is a particularly big car. Right? This um, uh, land something kind of car, and, um, or, and the other car that's equivalent to this begins with letter P. And so uh, that's relevant because if you took this translation into a different country where they drive smaller cars, then maybe we're talking up to 2,500, 3,000 cars. So anyway, it gives you a sense of scale. We, at the same time, are work in progress, and later on today, in this presentation, I want to show you the work that we are uh, currently um, designing and building. But uh, as a summary, when you see these later projects, I'm jumping right into 2025 projected figures. And this 2025 projected figures, what you see here is carbon savings in, is increasing dramatically, and also the percentage uh, reduction is also going up. The carbon reduction is because we are increasing our buildings at, at an exponential rate, which I think is really, really good news. There's some very, very interesting reasons for that. One, we just come out of a pandemic of us, and so there are people wanting to be in greener and healthier buildings. Two, we are also finding that there's a whole ESG movement so combined with the pandemic, people want, their, um, want to be living in greener buildings. People want their companies and staff to be in greener buildings. Green buildings also means that um, it's aligned with, with best practices in the world of ESG. And then that has an impact on our energy reduction. If it seems like a small increase, but let's not forget this is average across our entire portfolio. So in here, we've got some very good numbers but we've also got some challenging numbers uh, that are quite low and uh, we're working on. So this is just the average uh, number. But having said that, I think if across the board and if we can share these numbers in such a way that people understand how to achieve these numbers, I think approaching 50% decarbonisation um, from an energy point of view is a worthwhile target that will if catalyzed, will help the whole industry to move closer to the overall UAE targets. So how do we do this? And today I'd like to spend a bit more time than usual talking about the how. I think numbers you see in our ESG report, which is uh, available on our website. Uh, we talk a lot about um, what we do, and we talk a lot about why we do it, but because you all made the amazing effort to be here, I want to also talk about how we do it. And this is something that you're not going to find on our website. So environmental goals. I can see some people in the audience here today who actually worked with us before. And so you might be familiar with these uh, numbers and also familiar the way that Mazda City uh, engages the architecture and engineering design community. 
So we have numbers for energy reduction, water reduction, uh, waste reduction. We even have minimum benchmarks for green building rating systems. And a very important item here, number six, embodied carbon. I think we started our journey on tracking our embodied carbon more than 10 years ago, right? at a time when people did not really understand the relevance of embodied carbon, which is the carbon emission generated from the construction uh, of buildings. And now today is the big topic about trying to understand embodied carbon, what it actually means and how to uh, reduce it. And of course, the big challenge today is that people are asking reducing from what? If you want to reduce something, you have to have a baseline or some kind of benchmark to reduce from. Right? And those baselines actually don't exist today, either locally or globally. Nevertheless, we set up numbers. They might be right, they might be wrong. It's, it's okay. It's the important thing about this whole sheet here is that one has to have numbers in the first place. Right? Because without numbers, then you never really know from a performance point of view if you are moving forward or moving backwards. My favorite topic, collaborative uh, design. So numbers for the scientists, the Excel sheet person, the engineers, um, is the numbers also infectious for certain architects? It infected me, so I work with numbers, even though I'm an architect. And so how do we move to incorporating these numbers into the buildings? Here, uh, it's just a cross selection of different disciplines, potential disciplines involved in the building of a project, of, of a, sorry, in involved in a building project. Uh, depending on the scale of the project, some of these might not be there, but for me personally, I've come across all of them, all of them in one form or another working on, on projects. So you have an early design workshop and you get everyone into the room, right, and you have all these different disciplines sitting around each other and you're trying to put together, in our case, Mazda City, a solid, sustainable building. Right, so how do you go about it? I think um, we have been trying various different ways to, to solve this uh, issue. But before we get there, I'd just like to ask if I can have any offers and audience out of all these disciplines I see on the screen here, which do you think is the most important discipline when it comes to green buildings? And, by the way, ignore the last one. <laughs> because the owner is not the most important person. Any offers? Yes. So we have an offer for facilities management and with the reasoning as, which is absolutely valid. Any other offers? Peter. Yes. yes. And that's coming not from an architect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And last one. All absolutely uh, valid answers. Right? Facility management, architecture, and energy, right? And so I will offer an answer that is slightly different to all of that, and the answer I'd like to offer you, which is the most important discipline on this screen, the answer is simply my discipline. My discipline is the most important. And that's the answer for all of you here because you all studied, trained in your subject of your choice, right? And for the majority, I hope for the majority, that you chose the subject of, of your passion, of your interest, 
right? And it wasn't chosen by your parents. So, um, and then you went on a study and you succeeded and, they, and you're here today. So my discipline is the most important one. And that's the challenge because you have all these people sitting in a room, each person thinking that their discipline is the most important discipline, right? And you're trying to collaborate. And what happens? People start you know, elbowing, arguing, and trying to fight for space. Right? So how do you, trying to get all the dis different disciplines, share a common idea, a common mission to deliver the, the project, and to get everyone to run in the same direction? After all these years, and I've been working on this part for uh, Mazda City for the last 15 years, I think there's no obvious answer because the first of all you need to understand who's actually in the room and then once you understand that then you try to figure out a way for, for people to engage. We've tried various different ways. And for one example I just can share with you, we had a situation where we started role swapping. You know, we swapped the role of the architect with the mechanical engineer. Right? Can you imagine asking a mechanical engineer to do the layout of a building. Right. You know what happened? He got the mechanical spaces in the right place. <laughs> right? Which actually ended up getting all the ducts in the right place. And we got all the ducts in the right place, all the ceiling voids became shallower. And when the ceiling voids became shallower across six stories, and in this particular case, and this was actually a real story, we actually saved almost half a meter from each floor. Across six floors, that's three meters. We load the entire building by a whole story just by doing this one move. And the mechanical system was more effective. And from the owner's point of view, just imagine all the saving from all that facade we got rid of that was wrapping around the service zone and now we got a tighter building. And so who says that collaborative design, who says that environmental design is also not a profitable design? And, uh, and that's just a tiny example of what we do at Mazda City. We always look for those solutions where we are contributing to sustainability, contributing to the environment, but also, at the end of the day, we are an investment company, also finding the economic benefits. So therein is just one simple example of the relationship between costs and the environment. And I suppose one could say that Mazda City is a study is a thesis to understand the relationship with these two components. Right? From day one, we were told that we had to be a profitable company, whereas the industry question was, how much more money do you need to pay for sustainability? Right? Our answer to that, after struggling it for a long time, was simply, you're asking the wrong question. Because as soon as you have a premium, you assume there's extra cost, and if there's extra cost, you know what happens, right? Good enough reason not to do the project because they cost too much. So the solution for us in that particular case was we just turned the whole question upside down, right? We said for an investment case that works, that fulfills all the uh, business cases and commerciality and um, the business plan and, and, the, re and the, re the returns, for well, that fixed sum, how green can you make the building? Whereas before is you fix the green, up or down, and you're trying to figure out how much it costs. Right? This way of doing it, then you can never be over budget. Right? So the variable part is the sustainability, environmental sustainability part. And I'm saying that 10 years ago, we found that within a workable business plan in Abu Dhabi, competing against other developers in Abu Dhabi. We moved it all the way up to 40% energy saving. And I'm telling you that after working on this edge boundary for the last decade, we're moving that same model and now achieving net zero energy. And I know there are people in this room who can testify to that, who have worked with us and proven that it's absolutely doable. So just more example of integrated design. Integrated design is something that we believe in. Integrated design is, um, is where you find the solutions. Solutions never happen within a single discipline. Right? They always happen in the zone between the discipline. So when it comes to facade design, traditionally, you go to a facade designer and you say, please give me a nice 
um, facade and just started doing very, very nice facade drawings, absolutely beautiful drawings. Right? And then you choose your facade design based on the aesthetic of the facade. So traditionally that's what happens and you rely on the facade desi designer to have a good level of knowledge from an engineering point of view to make sure that it structurally stays up. Right? But Massa City looks at it in a different way because all these different aspects here has an impact on that facade. Right? How do you determine if a window is too large or too small? You have a full height window, top to bottom, prob chances are it's too large for Abu Dhabi because you're letting in too much uh, heat, probably letting in too much light. And I've seen full height facades where the blinds are down all the time. So you're wasting energy and you have this expensive glass wall. Of course, if you go to the other extremes, that you have this tiny little hole called a window, and it becomes what, too dark. It doesn't work. You can't see what you are doing. But it saves a lot of energy, because you, around that window, you've got this kind of massive, thick wall. So if one is too small because it's too dark, and one is too big because it lets in too much energy, somewhere between two, these two extremes must be the right size from an environmental point of view, right? And once you take that approach, all the tools are available for you to work out the answer of what is the right size of a window. It's a very simple question. What is the right size of a window from an environmental point of view? Because traditionally, when you size a window, how do you do it? Show me the elevations. Show me the renderings. Option A, option B, option C, right? So, same problem by just looking at it differently to try and find different answers. Now, I also want to touch on costs. This is a diagram to show the relationship of the cost of green buildings, regardless of its lead or SD Dharma rating, increasing as you go from left to right, and then compared to a blue band, which is assumed Abu Dhabi, um, typical cost of buildings, right? And it's a diagram like this, and these are based on studies done by mainly cost consultants. Um, one study I've seen took 200 buildings, different standard of lead green building rating system, and plotted the cost um, against the sustainability level. And this is the kind of chart they got. Right. And then from that, they extrapolated the green buildings can be very, very costly. Right. But they did not go into why the building was costly. Right. They did not tell you that all the toilets were lined with Italian marble or something. Right. And so, no one goes there because you got this one number, cost per square meter, done. But what's interesting about this diagram is that in all cases, or in most of the cases, you get buildings that's touching the average cost. So our interest at Mazda City really is what's happening over here and here. Because that's proof that within that cost zone, something is doable. And once we knew it was doable, it was our job to find what's that doable. And it goes back to what I was talking about before, the solutions of integrated design, solutions of collaboration, solutions of asking the right questions. Now, this is a, another overlaying dimension out of uh, all this thing, but it always goes back to this uh, resource efficiency again. The example about the window large window or small window, what is the right size? That's a very simple example. What we're really talking about is what we designers like to say, passive design. And passive design is about um, how you determine your, the shape of your buildings. Is it a square building? Is it a circular building? Or is it a long, thin building? Is it an L-shaped building? You can fit the same um, floor area inside. Okay. And when you have openings and you have windows, are they large or small? And what direction these windows are facing? Are they facing north away from the sun or facing uh, east-west directly into the sun? 
or somewhere in between, like facing south. All these things has very, very big impacts on the energy profile of a building. We even made one study of a particular building that is fully glazed, and this full glazing was facing east and facing west, of course, so they got the sunrise and the sunset going straight into a full glazed building. And we did some very rudimentary energy modeling by taking the same design and just turning it 90 degrees so that the glass face was facing north and south and not east and west. And we estimated that that single move without changing anything else, you can reduce your cooling load by up to 15% with no change in specifications. Now, if you change the specification, you can go even further. You do collaborative design going even further, right? That's when you move the 15 to the 40, right? But 15%. So it seems that very big moves can be made right down here. So we're saying, let's try our best to get our basics right. When you determine how you place your building, what shape, if you're designing a villa, think about it, right? We've all been in villa and, you, and it has a large window standing on the west side. And in the late afternoon, so why is all this heat just keep pounding in? There's a reason for that, right? Because someone placed a window there for the view and not for the energy purposes, right? Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, by the way. If your view is more important than your energy, fine. So, but you can't get the view and then start complaining and say, how come, you know, there's an environmental problem with this, right? There's, you have to make decisions one day or the other. And then once you get your basics right, then we talk about some active design, uh, cool mechanical systems, shading devices, right, which is uh, um, gets you next level. And then, then and only then do we resort, if you want to go all the way to net zero, with some renewable energy. And it's very clear that if you get the bottom part wrong, then either you're going to be spending a lot of money up there or Worst case, you're not going to achieve what you want to do because you don't have enough roof on this, you don't have enough roof space, or some other constraints already kick in, and then that dreaded word value engineer kicks in. So when you put all that together, I just want to cross selection uh, examples of buildings that we've built. These are not all our buildings. Uh, we have a probably around, lost count now, about 30 buildings completed at Mazda City. So it's just a selection, but it demonstrates um, our uh, relationship with performance. So we break the building down into sort of passive energy reduction and an active and renewable energy reduction. On the passive side, all our buildings work really, really hard. Notice there's no full height glass windows here important first line of defense and what we've been finding is that um, there's only so much you can do with passive design I mean that's the conclusion on this although it's really really important is a law of diminishing return you're always going to have that weather out there you're always going to have that really strong Sun uh, out there so one um, accepts that and if, if you can sort of approach up to 50% right I think you're doing uh, ex ex extremely well then you look at what your new renewables can do for you. Having a good foundation, right? Uh, the renewable, the triangle at the top kicks in. Now, you can see on the very early buildings, incubator building, 0% in our early buildings. Uh, we did not resort to any form of renewable energy, partly because, back to this cost equation, it was very, very uh, expensive at the time. It came uh, during that building. I recall that solar power, you were talking about 40 cents per kilowatt hour, whereas today it's well under two cents per kilowatt hour. So that's an in incredible saving. And what do we do at Mazda City? We take advantage of that. As that price comes down and it fits in our model, case by case basis, the model works. We can fit, remember I said, fix your business plan and then you go as green as possible. And so somewhere um, between 2020 to 2023, 
we, we made a shift. Right? We made a shift and on different typologies of building, we were testing net zero energy. When you put all this together, the net zero energy and the passive and active design, you get these numbers. These are numbers that you would normally see. These are numbers you, you would be um, rated on by these green building rating system, be it LEED or Estedama. And for energy mechanical engineers here, this is the ASHRAE baseline. And in the bottom three, right, it's tantamount to the net zero energy because on the 12 month cycle, you're actually producing more energy on site than you'll be consuming. So uh, I already explained that I have this affinity against uh, nice renderings, but uh, being an architect, I like changing my mind, so I'm now going to show some nice renderings. Right. And this is uh, our, one of our first office uh, net zero energy building. We call it the, well, I call it the shoe box, actually, because it's deadly simple. It's a rectangular box uh, and a, a single core with one side staircase. Uh, why? We gave it an internal tag name within Mazda City net zero energy for all. So we wanted to produce the simplest, simplest box, make it efficient, and then make it as cost effective as possible. So although it's just a box, it's also net zero energy, it's lead platinum, it's Estedama four pearl, right? and there's an associated uh, well rating that goes with it as well. You see, we do understand that in this world, we're not just dealing with iconic buildings, but the majority of buildings are just regular everyday buildings. So our buildings tend to be, each building has their own little mission statement of how they can contribute to a larger story so we, that we can share our ideas and our findings to the community at large. This is the LINK project. Right? And the LINK project comprises of five buildings, two office buildings, one residential, and one multi-use hall, but the building on the front left is a co-living, co-working building into the same building, right? and also net zero energy. The idea between, behind putting co-living, co-working into one building was the idea that you have a mechanical system that's serving the working part during the day and the living part during the night. So from an owner's point of view, there are efficiencies of taking this concept. The only challenge was is that when we tried to submit this to um, the municipality for approval, they said that this building mix or typology uh, does not exist in Abu Dhabi, and therefore we could not get approval. We were absolutely delighted to hear that because then we knew that this would be the first one. Right. And so, but we have a very good relationship with the Abu Dhabi municipality and uh, the whole DMT organization. So after a series of discussions, it was agreed that we can have this mixed use into the plot. And now this building is under construction uh, today with delivery dates by the end of next year. There's a closer view of it. And this is the MC Square project seven office buildings, of which, um, again, all lead platinum and all Estadama four pro and all well gold. In fact, in a funny sort of way, I showed you numbers er earlier on, but it, we got to a stage where lead platinum is our baseline almost, and, and it's something that is not even discussed about. It's just a given that every project we do, lead Platinum, of course. I mean, why are we even talking about it? And I think that's a kind of a, a good story for everyone working in Mazda City, and we have many Mazda City colleagues uh, with us, of that kind of psychological shift. Right? There's also high performing and the, the bottom runners, and the challenge is to get the bottom runners to move as, as high as possible. I think we, we can safely say we've reached a stage where the bottom runners are achieving lead platinum, and then we're exploring how to now make net zero energy 
the, the norm. So in these seven buildings, six of them are, are the regular lead platinum buildings, and the one on the furthest right is a net zero energy 12,000 square meter uh, HQ building. It resides next to this top triangular building, um, and there's something very interesting going on here from a Mazda City uh, landlord perspective, because in that triangular building, we call it the IRENA building, International Renewable Energy Agency headquarters is in that building, and they share this building with ENEC, the Emirates Nuclear Energy Corporation. So you have renewable energy and nuclear energy sharing the same building, overlooking the same uh, atrium. We were questioned originally about why we put these two, two entities together, right? but now, and they've been together for a number of years now, and it's interesting how the narrative changed in terms of the world of energy mix. So, of course, you know, it's, uh, it's just such a natural relationship, and after COP28, the role of nuclear is, is being understood as being critical for this energy transformation. But we didn't stop there, because in the net zero energy building, um, which looks like this, uh, we have uh, just recently announced that we have an amazing tenant to go in there as well to complement IRENA and the uh, Emirates Nuclear Energy Corporation, and that is the Abu Dhabi Department of Energy. Right. So this will be the new headquarters. Um, we're targeting to finish this by the end of this year, so to be moving in next year. And I'd like to say that's Mazda City contribution to the energy transition story. Get everyone together, let's create a platform, and then uh, we will increase our chance of collaborations and improve it. So this is the atrium under construction. This was taken about two months ago of this HQ building. And now I want to touch on our relationship with our 2050 uh, UAE net zero uh, strategy. Right. And so just marking out the timeline, marking with some of our contributing buildings are, we already said to ourselves, okay, 2030, and this is very much aligned with the UAE strategy, we want to get to uh, net zero for scope one and scope two emissions. Scope one means direct emissions, like fuel on site. Scope two will commonly known as your direct use electricity bill and your direct use cooling bill. And it seems like scope three is everything else that's not in scope one and two. That's the easy way to explain scope three. And so we set up these targets. And um, the first thing that we needed to do, right, how to talk about EUIs, energy use intensity. Now, I've been talking energy in terms of percentage savings, right, whereas they provide an international metric where people can understand. But at the same time, there are flaws in the way that um, energy reduction is measured. Right. And two buildings that are declaring, let's say, 30% energy saving could have very, very diff different energy profiles, could have very, very different actual physical energy use. So a much more interesting figure is EUI, energy use intensity, which is measured in kilowatt hour of energy per square meter per of construction per year. Right. And for us, we run an average of 145 as of current operation, and our job is trying to improve that. We are saying that we want to move closer to 100, and this is portfolio-wide. So every time we throw in a net zero building, it just pulls down the average slightly, yeah? But we need to want to get 100, and I'll explain why in, in a moment. I think with those three projects that I said are under construction uh, at the moment, when those kick in and fully operational, we're estimating that we will move to 145 down to 131. So still a lot of work to do by 2030. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, um, we're going, we, we are witnessing this kind of exponential growth phase. So we are optimistic that with the uh, support internally and, extern and externally and working with, with uh, valued partners, we have a very good chance of getting there. Then the next thing we need to do is to deal with our 
existing buildings as well. Because when I say one of our buildings is 40% energy saving, that is the same as saying it's actually using 60% energy, right? So it's 60% energy that you get rid of. And therefore, we have to also ramp up our renewable energy. And based on our current portfolio and the projected construction of 2030, we estimate that we need another 10 megawatt, which will complement the 10 megawatt we already have on site today. We also understand our rollout between 2030 and 2040, exactly be, uh, what we need to build, because Mazar City is a defined space, right? There are third parties uh, involved, which is not part of this equation, but our portfolio has a, a current fixed target of how much construction is going on. And using the same formula and assuming that we can hit the average 100 kilowatt hour per square meter per year, that means for us is 15 megawatts. Now, these 10 and 15 megawatts, they can go wherever you like. They can go on top of buildings, they can go in the parks, right? We, we are in the middle of installing a, a solar shade way on, on the roads, that has PV covering it. They can be anywhere uh, you like. Just that the total has to contribute into the right place. We are a, a city level landlord, so we can, from our perspective, take advantage of that, of doing an overall energy balance, which leads to an overall greenhouse gas balance. Now, I mentioned alignment in 2050. And this is where the practical reality sets in. By this measure, we should hit net zero by 2040. So what happens between 2040 and 2050? Adjustment. We are already finding, even with our current buildings, buildings are not often, reverse that, buildings are often not used the way they're intended. Right? Uh, for many, many reasons. Right. A, a new tenant comes in or a new owner and they use it in different ways. An office building might start having lab components being inserted, for example, and that will just kind of blow your energy budget so it's, it's a sky high. When I declare that our 2022 numbers is 38.4, it's really a statement that the majority of, of our buildings is between 40 and 50 percent. 40 and 50 percent. In fact, some of our buildings are achieving over 50 percent. But you have a couple of outliers that are way down, and they're way down because the use we have put in them are not aligned with the energy modeling originally done by the architects and engineers. But there are solutions for that. I mean, you can remodel the thing and, and then uh, re-baseline. Uh, but nevertheless, we're holding true what is trying to understand the comparison of design to actual uh, reality. So just when you think that um, we have this kind of wonderful roadmap to net zero 50, there's something missing here, isn't there? Embody carbon. So the previous slide is really about operational issues. Right? And I also like to add the the 10 and 15 megawatts that I, was, that I was referring to is also sufficient to compensate for the footprint of waste and water as well. That's part of the calculation. But embodied carbon, the big elephant in the room, it's a really, really tough one. There's no denying it. We've been very fortunate that we've been measuring our buildings since um, 2010. But even though we're measuring it, it would be very difficult for me to tell you about how well we are actually doing. Because as I mentioned before, there is no officially declared baseline that you can measure against. But having said that, there are a number of reports out there that are making estimations. And um, you can find them online. And they seem to converge around this number here, 800 kilograms of CO2 per meter square. Some of them are slightly less, some of them are slightly more, but 800 seem to be converging on. Right? And so, from our experience, we agree with this number. And the reason why we agree with this number, yes, it's because we're better than it. No, I mean, that's not the real reason. Um, the real reason why we agree with the number is that because we've been already taking steps to introduce green building materials in our building. 
and we have a lot, as much recycled content steel as we can find. We have recycled aluminum. We have a low carbon concrete. What's available in supply chain, we introduce it into our projects. And those three elements, along with glass and insulation, probably account for 80% plus of the embodied carbon. Now, I also know that if you took all that away and use business as usual material, then this number will probably go back to 800 plus. So therefore, probably 800 is not um, too far off the mark. And 642 is where we are today. Uh, is it a great number from all the work we're doing? I would say probably not, although it's much better than business as usual. Part of the reason why this number is not lower is because we do have uh, one, two, or actually one and a half buildings that was actually made out of steel, right? And steel at the time, 10 years ago, was a very high carbon emissions related to it. Uh, we have one building, I'll miss it to you, that is actually over 1,000 kilograms per square meter of construction because it's a steel structured building, right? And so when we, after we built that one, I mean, that was our last steel building, right? Until the supply chain can, can do otherwise. So it's a, again, understanding what's available in market and making the best use of it. That's the way that we approach it. The MC Square HQ, the Department of Energy building, this is the design number. And we believe that if the final building sticks much, very much closer to spec, then we won't be far off this number. The shoe box, 511, going down again. And there's a very good reason for that, because the shoe box has open air surface parking, whereas the MC Square HQ carries a whole level of basement parking with it, which is not part of your floor area calculation. So it's carrying a lot of extra concrete. So the message here is, if your absolute focus is lowering embodied carbon, right, all that extra material you put in that's not part of the calculation is things that you think about. I mean, if you go down three, four, five floors of car parking in the basement, just be mindful of why you're doing it. It's going to knock your embodied carbon number out of the park, but maybe then you have a land pressure issue and you're forced to go down. So these are the realities of, of uh, working in this space. Right. And then this is the number we would like to get to by 2030. Again, appropriately, it's 50% reduction from the business as usual. Uh, we are work in progress. Anyone in the room who's working with us uh, knows already that we are targeting not exactly this number, but it certainly does, certainly does begin, begin with number four. So continuing to raise the bar. So that comes to the end of my um, talk. And uh, at the end of my talk, I, I hope you've um, had something that of value taken away. But, but there's one more thing I'd like to leave you with. We're about decarbonization. So you cannot leave here without contributing to the decarbonization of Mazda City. And so we like to uh, offer something in return for everyone who we made the effort to come and uh, join us here today. I thank you very much. And these are for people who have registered. There may be people in the room who have not registered. And for those who have not registered, it's easy. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for the insightful presentation. Uh, I'll open the floor to questions. Good evening, Chris. Thank you very much for uh, this very interesting presentation, very uh, insightful. Uh, I would like to know, uh, you gave quite a comprehensive presentation on the pathway of Mazdar City to net zero. And one of the uh, actions taken in the future will be adding uh, solar power. Um, in the calculation of the carbon emissions, did you include the 
recycling of the solar panels that will be used because if I'm not mistaken, the life expectancy of a solar panel is something like 20 years or so. So at a moment they will have to be replaced. So uh, what is the uh, Im carbon impact of the manufacture and then of the recycling of the solar panels that will be used in Mazdar City? So, um, well, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, very, very re relevant. Uh, I would clarify first of all, when I talk about embodied carbon here, it's really the upfront embodied carbon, so the, the embodied carbon for construction, right? Um, I have not really talked about the embodied carbon of building operations, except for energy and water. And then certainly I have not talked about end of life carbon, so after the buildings, in our case, our buildings are designed for 60 year lifespan minimum and what happens after that. And so uh, this, is, this part for us is still work in progress. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the designers we're working with are um, very graciously also offering doing full life cycle assessment, making assumptions how to get all the way uh, to the end. So we look at the numbers and um, we use those to some guides to some of our decision-making process. And so the part about the solar panels, uh, you're right, the usual assumption is 20-year lifespan. And that's because uh, there's not that many or very few large-scale solar plants. Uh, even today, that's more than 20 years old. And I think um, to be straight up front, there's going to be a challenge related to this when these panels start to reach the end of life. The 10 megawatt plant at Mazda City was inaugurated, was started producing power in 2009. So we are five years away from 20 years of use. What's interesting for us, we've been looking at the energy profile from year one and how it gradually uh, decreases. The assumption at the beginning was power output decreases by 1% per year. Um, fortunately, the reality is actually is not far from that. So when it comes to 2029, which is 20 years after this, um, for Mazar City, we got some decisions to make about what to do with that field. Do we remove all those panels? because the land that it sits on has, since we started, has become extremely valuable because of everything that's built around it, that's kind of land economics kicking in, right? Or do we remove it and put a new field in there and produce probably 30 megawatts for the same area? Because let's not forget, efficiency of panel has been increasing dramatically over the years, right? Um, or, there's also an argument to keep it running. Because if you're reducing 1% per year, then after 20 years, actually this plant is still producing a lot of power, right? So the choice of trying to throw it out, and these panels are not easily recyclable, we all know that, uh, to the option of finding a burial ground for them, <laughs> or actually just keeping them running, um, and it could be running at, let's say, 70%, but still producing a lot of power. They started off producing 17 million kilowatt hour initially. Right? Currently, they are in the uh, averaging about 14 million kilowatt hour for this 10 megawatt. And maybe by 2029, we'll be down to 13 million kilowatt hour. That's still a substantial amount of power, which is very, very useful. So there's no direct answer. Um, you just, I would say, come back in five years' time and I'll give you the <laughs> answer. Uh, because because it's, a, it's a combination of seeing what the power output, land economics, what's the alternative use, right? and if anyone can come up with a better way to recycle old PV panels, right, let me know because I would want to buy shares in that company.
Thanks a lot for sharing. Clearly the numbers and statistics and examples that you're showing set a good example for people to follow because you're showing what's achievable in terms of the built environment. But there's another thing that Mazdar City's planning that's not related necessarily to individual buildings or building design. And that's related to the master plan itself in the form of the transportation networks that are being planned. And I'm asking a question, and I'm not sure there's a direct answer, but the notion of how much, how many car trips, for example, could be reduced as a result of this planned network. If there was a way to quantify that, that would also serve as an example to other developments that might be considering things like adding micro-mobility or some new types of mobility that aren't currently in vogue. Uh, clearly, I mean, master planning, urban planning, the whole planning of the city, and I have colleagues here who are the, the brains behind that section. There's Lucas, my colleague, Lucas Soko, and Sebastian, also in, in the audience. Um, and if you wish to talk to him uh, after we finish here, there, there's a, a lot of value there. And certainly what I'm talking about here cannot be done unless the foundation of the master plan is, is also correct. And it's a master plan that it is about um, walkability, it's about human centricity, um, the relationship between plots, relationship between buildings is, is mission critical uh, for us. Um, public realms are made as comfortable as possible. We all, we like to say that the felt temperature at Mazda City is anywhere between um, five to 10 degrees lower than business as usual. And that's, be, that, and that's thanks to how the whole master plan works, its orientation, how it's the wind capturing. I haven't touched on that today. I said I've been concentrating on decarbonization, but that is a big factor. It has direct and indirect impact on what we're doing here today. Similarly, on mobility, um, if anyone of you have visited Mazda City, you probably noticed that we do have a very, very wide range of, uh, of mobility. So starting from making the moving between buildings as walkable as possible, to the to the e-scooters, um, to the autonomous vehicles, to autonomous um, uh, minibuses, and also the, the planned routes for future light rail transit and metro system, they're all embedded uh, in there. The mixed-use nature of Mazda City evolves around very, very roughly 60% residential, with the remaining 40% part community and part a light industry and part commercial. Right? And the reason why it breaks down that way is that we believe that, or we understand that if you take a slice of Abu Dhabi city, the greatest city, and understand what these ratios are, you probably get similar ratio about how much residentials uh, relates to these activity parts. And so it's, it's, not, it's deliberate, it's not an accident that that ratio exists at Mazda City. So in a kind of theoretical world, everyone can be living and working at Mazda City uh, without actually leaving the boundaries. I mean, we, one of our net zero energy buildings, one of the seven is actually a school, a gem school is being constructed at this moment and they are also on track for net zero energy, uh, having worked uh, closely with the Mazda City team over these, these uh, years. I'm not sure how you can actually quantify that, apart from just measuring the uh, actual facts. But I, I think to, the way I look at it is that you, let's have a case where no one who works in Mazda City lives in Mazda City, that's one extreme. And then you've got the other extreme, everyone is living, working there, right? And I suppose that is the, the way you can see where you are on, on this kind of moving bar. Oftentimes people ask, well, how many people fits in the Mazda city? And we have numbers that evolve around uh, um, 40,000 residents and 50,000 working population, right? Those not not exact numbers, but we always talk about residential population and working population. Right? And we, we're not able at this point in time to say, well, actually, it's 
one number because everyone is working, living there at the same time. So really, from the, if, if there's such thing as a KPI, from that perspective, what you want is these two numbers to overlap as much as possible, right? And that's the metric. And in my own personal opinion, opinion that's one of the metrics that will determine um, how successful we will be as we kind of finally build out overlap as much as possible. Thank you, Chris, for your um, valuable presentation. I, I think it, it has uh, great numbers, you know, to look at and uh, learn from in um, uh, developing um, the net zero building. Now, my uh, concern is users, end users, okay, they are not <coughs> mentioned as a factor. Okay, I was going to mention, you know, the end users as an important uh, factor in, in the achievement of net zero. And I argue, you know, that uh, we should look at uh, uh, the end users in terms of uh, culture and identity and connectivity. Okay, because we have multi-culture. Okay, so we need to um, in a sense, create a, a, a an environment, you know, and master can be the environment for those cultures, you know, to integrate together and come up with something um, uh, fantastic worldwide. Okay, now there is segregation of, between. Uh, identities, let's put it this way, okay? So I'd be very happy to discuss this with your team if, if I'm allowed, okay? And I would like to see it in, in your next presentation, <laughs> if, if that happens, you know, thank you. Um. Thank you for your, your, your commentary. Um, I think, as I kind of mentioned right at the start of this presentation of the multi-dimensionalness of city building, city design, and saying that you can look at it as, um, I mean, cities are soft things. Uh, cities at its heart is about cities of community and, and city of culture. And all these things are uh, absolutely also critical. Um, so I hope you can understand that Mazda City is, is not only about decarbonization. This is just one strand of what we are doing. And we, have, we do have a thriving community at Mazda City even uh, today. And there is a lot of uh, community engagement for several reasons, just regular community engagement and then there's also transfer of knowledge, and then there's uh, sharing uh, uh, like-mindedness. All those things exist. So I'm happy to share with those all, all those other activities and understanding the relationship between the built environment and the impact it has on the residences living in them. discussed about um, the sustainability of the buildings. How about our area sustainability? Like, sustainability isn't just about achieving net zero. It's about a lot more than this. We look at the sustainable development goals. Only one goal is about um, carbon emissions. I'm interested in what is Mazda doing to, to work on some of the other areas of sustainability? Like thinking about trade practices, like 
what companies are actually working within Mazda, how much they care about sustainability. Are they composting? Are they recycling? Are they buying fair trade coffee? Are they thinking about where their products are coming from? How much are you able to influence what kind of companies are operational within the city to ensure that this continues to be sustainable? Because we want to have a sustainable world. Yes, a world with net zero, but also looking at other areas of sustainability. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we all uh, well understand that um, sustainability and decarbonizations are very, very different topics, but interlinked at a certain point. Right? Uh, a, a decarbonized city does not mean a sustainable city, and vice versa is also correct. And again, today I really just concentrated on one strand, talking about what's happening in our carbon, and that because that is a subject of much of the current debate. Um, but that does not mean that Mazda City is not um, working in all the other areas. Uh, the internal discussion we have is, is very clear about this, and we often debate when we start a building design, to what extent we're decarbonizing and to what extent we are trying to make this a somewhere for sustainable living, fully recognizing that they're very, very different topic. The decarbonization and then there is tackling the single subject of climate change. It just happened that a lot of the touch points has a connection with sustainability subjects. But there are many, many other areas in sustainability that does not impact the carbon. And so, um, for example, when you're dealing with air quality, right, air quality is for the wellness of the people inside a building. Right? Whether that's good or bad might have zero impact on the carbon emissions of the, the building. I also mentioned that we fully embrace um, now, the well certification. The well certification is a relatively new certification system that complements uh, Estadama and complements LEED. And well certification is about health and well being of the, of the occupants of the building. So, this is a relatively new field, but it's something that we recognize as something really, really important. Um, it's, and this whole space deals, uh, apart from the health and Wealth, it also goes into the food chain, it goes into training, it goes into grievances. It's everything about the users of the building. For us, when we embrace well into our buildings, it was something new for us because for the building that we operate, um, it was the experience of working very, very closely with the human resource team, human capital team, and general services, and suddenly their input was uh, critical to the outcome of the whole building. Even down to how you lay your food out in the canteen. I mean, have you ever wondered why when you go to a good canteen and you start collecting your food, they put all the veggies first? Because someone's hoping that you're gonna fill your plate up with vegetables before you get to the meats. Right? And that's a deliberate intention uh, about thinking about how people relate to buildings and the whole psychology to go with it. So I, again, um, there is all that going on. The community engagement about moving to a greener society as a way of life uh, that is absolutely in work in progress at Mazda City. I'm not saying for one moment that it's easy Change is always challenges. Everyone like to just stick what to what they're used to. Right? We start with our own organization. We are went through our process of how we gradually um, uh, shifted away from um, all the things that we know is bad for the environment. Um, I would say that even internally, that took a bit of time. So 
to kind of spread that message to all the community members within Mazda City is certainly uh, not missed from us. So I appreciate that comment. Right? And I appreciate also that uh, we are working progress, but making good progress. We have time for one last question. Uh, thank you, Chris, for your uh, wonderful presentation. It covers most of the aspect of energy and as well as uh, embodied carbon. But I just want to ask you with, this, with regards to the building perspective, so does Mazdar City has any plan for a commitment to SBTI? Or uh, is there, because SBTI for the building phase, it says uh, for the embodied carbon as well as for the operational uh, emissions. So is there any plan or is there any ex existing plan available for science commitment to science-based targets? Thank you. The short answer is yes. Um, we've been co collecting our inventory, um, baselining from 2019 our carbon emissions, which is uh, in line with the UAE baseline. So 2019, 2020, 2020, all the way up to 2022, and we're collecting for 2023 uh, at the moment. Um, uh, we have plans, definitely, and, uh, and already engaging the right parties with um, the science-based targets initiative. We are also looking into GRESP, Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark. Um, and also, um, we are being part of the Mabadala family. There are also some overarching frameworks uh, from the entity that's, that is managing a sovereign fund. And there are things like um, this One Planet Sovereign Funds that also sends you down a route of partially SBTI and also very importantly and related to this third party verification. Right? I think for us in terms of accounting, we are also uh, maturing and our next step is to get these um, global verification. Not so much to try and prove a point, but just to make sure that what we are doing is aligned with the uh, best practice, and so that when we communicate, people understand the baseline where we're coming from. So come back next year, and uh, <laughs> be there. So that's all the time we have. Uh, let's thank Chris one more time. And I'd like to thank the audience for the insightful questions. Uh, I'm sure Chris is, will, will be happy to uh, answer more questions uh, over drinks and canapes right outside the room. Um, I'll ask you to please mark your calendars for our next lecture in this series, which will take place on April 29th, and we'll share information, more information about the next lecture pretty soon. Um, with that, I'll thank you all again for coming, and uh, I hope I wish you a great evening.